everybody. Welcome to another episode of Individuality Unleashed. I'm Vern Trimble, Senior Director of Marketing here at Wonderkin. And today I'm joined by my good friend Vadim Greenberg, who's the head of client success at Prescient.ai. Vadim, welcome. So glad to have you on the podcast today. Hi, glad to be here. I'd love for you to introduce yourself to the people, tell them who you are. Sure, yeah. Um, my name is Vadim. I've been in consumer marketing for about 16 years now. I started out in um, customer research for a company called Kantar World Panel. We worked with um, mostly FMCG brands, so like personal care, beverages, that sort of stuff. Really just collecting data and understanding what was going on with those customers. Um, and then I had an opportunity in 2014 to switch to uh, startups and D2C. The reason I left is I just wanted something more interesting and try to build something, be a part of something. And when you build something, you end up having to learn everything from scratch a lot. Um, so my first company was Dagny Dover, a handbag and accessories brand. And I essentially built the growth engine there because I had the opportunity to learn how to run a business, do all the things that are fun to do. Um, and from that and the success there, uh, I got the opportunity to work for Hatch Collection, maternity clothing brand. Uh, and I led everything digital there. So not just growth and paid marketing, but also e-commerce, um, all the work with the marketing team in terms of building retention and emails, et cetera, all the little pieces that go in. Um, we actually use Wonderkind, by the way, uh, when we were there. Um, and then from that opportunity, I got the chance to work at Maud, which is a sexual health and wellness brand. Um, and there I worked very, very closely with the founder and CEO, Eva. Um, and really it was all revenue and just really trying to figure out how to grow the business entirely, not just through digital means. So kind of little step changes up, but every part of the way I was a part of a lot of marketing ops and a lot of conversation about LTV and loyalty. Really cool. So Vadim is not going to toot his own horn, but I will. He is an expert. So okay. we're <laughs> thank you. Okay. Absolutely. I'll take it. Uh, so Vadim, today I want to talk about a really interesting uh, topic. It's the economics of loyalty and performance marketing. Mm -hmm. Right now we are facing an unprecedented time uh, w with what we consider to be a retail recession uh, that is brought about by the fact that we are facing or an impending uh, global economic downturn. A lot of our marketers out there are just recovering from uh, the pandemic and being successful during those trying times, but now we're facing another uh, crisis that could impact the way in which they do business and they drive revenue. So uh, what I'd love to discuss with you today and help our audience out there understand is like what strategies can they deploy specifically around loyalty, which is an often misunderstood subject when it comes to uh, to performance marketing and mm -hmm. retention and loyal and just overall marketing strategy. And have you shed, shed some light and add your expertise to the conversation to really help uh, marketers and brands out there thrive during this difficult time? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I have probably too much to say. We want you to say it all. <laughs> okay, We'll great. chop it up in post. <laughs> got it, got it, got it. Um, um, so uh, can you walk us through what uh, what we mean by customer loyalty and why is it important? Well, I think uh, I'd love to like, back up one minute to how brands and companies have been affected by what you just talked about. Yes. Um, by the economic downturn, by complexity in marketing, um, and really... The, the outcome of what happened since I was 14.5 and the global recession and economic downturns because of COVID, what it's really done is it, it's created lack of trust in platforms and lack of um, real clear planning strategy to be able to hit numbers the way that people used to, right? I mean, obviously there, there are tons of smart marketers who are making the best of it that they possibly can, but it's not, it's fundamentally different, right? And there's a couple of things that have really changed. And one of those is people have to go higher up in the funnel now mm -hmm. than they used to before. So a lot of focus is being shed on, on those parts of the more traditional advertising funnel, like before digital marketing, before Facebook and Instagram got you where you needed to go faster, people had to do a lot of upfront work, right? Yeah. So people are, brands now are reliving that scenario. So it's like a return to like a golden age of marketing. Yeah, I don't know if there's ever been a golden age, but sure, yeah, it's a return to something. And it's, it's difficult. It's yeah. creating a lot of complexity. And especially for smaller brands who are really used to raising money on efficacy and ROAS, yeah. right? Which was a given when you were getting 3x return on Facebook or Instagram. Totally. And now you're sitting at less than two or you don't know, right? So what ends up happening is people have to put more work in to the upper funnel where they didn't have to, which puts stress and strain on their existing marketing team and makes you really have to worry and care a lot more, even more so than before, about keeping customers, right? right. Because they're so hard to get in the first place, right? There's a lot of like nuances to it we can talk through, but essentially what loyalty is, is 
that your propensity to be able to keep those customers, right. right? In whatever way that you can imagine. But ideally what you're saying is I got a customer, they liked our stuff, whatever it is, they think we're great, and hopefully they're also a brand ambassador of some sort or you know, with their peers. Mm -hmm. So loyalty is really keeping that person around um, because of what you've done. And it's pretty clear why it's important, obviously. Mm -hmm. like, cut to the chase, like it helps drive revenue. Yes. Um, <laughs> it helps make you money. Um, it's a simple equation at the end of the day, really, it's, right? It's yeah. Really quite More money from the existing customer equals less money we have to spend to keep revenue going in the direction we want it to. Exactly right. So with that in mind, with the, with the table sort of set for our marketers uh, for this conversation today, we want to provide value and we want to provide actionable insights that helps marketers out there get through this time. Uh, so I'd love for you to talk to us today about strategies for loyalizing customers. Um, yeah. Marketers always want to just essentially gain a better understanding of how to do things. We have marketers at different uh, skill levels and proficiencies. Mm -hmm. uh, so just in plain terms, like what can marketers do to drive success using loyalty strategies? Right. I mean, so when you think of loyalty, you're thinking about usually, right? You're usually thinking about, okay, we have a customer. How do we keep them? That's what I just defined it as, right? But really the the core ethos of a brand or the quality of a product is super important to in the acquisition as well, right? And as you continue that, so when you introduce yourself to a customer, their initial experience with you, the more consistent that is, the reason why they wanted to spend money on your thing anyway, or your service anyway, if you maintain that consistency, that'll help drive that loyalty. So you have to have a really good upfront sort of position, right? right. And I think that in the past three years, what we've seen is it's, you know, we can talk about price, especially in the economy, right. but Really, it's about having that clarity, transparency, honesty, and, and, and holding on to those core values that people are speaking out to more and more. All the best D2C brands now, especially ones that create products, right? Sustainability, inclusivity, uh, transparency, care for their employees and their vendors. It's, it really, truly is important. And people care a lot more and more and more and more as we sort of see new brands coming to the market. So it's a lot about... Uh behavior of, of, of customers and how they choose. It actually makes me think about microeconomics, mm -hmm. just the traditional way of thinking about that is putting price at the center of the decision-making mm -hmm. purchasing uh, uh, process. But really when you think about it and what we're discussing today, we're looking more at a behavioral economics model which kind of trumps uh, that uh, antiquated model, if you will, in, in my personal opinion, where it really puts uh, value ahead of, of cost. Um, can you talk to us why, what matter, what specifically, and how can marketers define what is impo important to customers as opposed to considering just price? Because price alone seems not to be the answer or the end all be all to driving loyalty for a brand. Yeah, I mean, price is still important, obviously. Um, there's a reason why there is a whole study built around it, right? Yeah. Um, and whenever I've done surveys for customers, um, whether it be with larger brands, back when I first started in D2C and even more recently, People still want a good price, right? right? But how they define what good is, is that's the real word there, what the value is versus the cost of the item. And essentially, you know, all these values I just talked about that newer brands are really bringing into the, the, the fold, which is, you know, the sustainability aspect, um, uh, transparency, caring about their employees, et cetera. Those are sort of table stakes where if you don't do those, people won't even consider you, yeah. regardless of how inexpensive you are or you claim to be relatively valuable. However, that value is really defined by a lot of, it's the product itself, obviously, but it's also the experience that people have in either researching your product or shopping your product on, their, on, the, on your site or wherever they might be buying it. And then how clear the, the usefulness of the product and the quality of the product is and the consist, consistency of it, right? And there's a lot right now going on where reviews and research are really crucial, mm -hmm. right? So people shortcut to, to those things that they see online. So if you browse most reviews, they say worth the price, right? Or not worth the price, or how, this is so expensive. Like you, it sort of gets out of your, the brand's control. So the more you build that into your narrative in a really creative way, the better. Now we could talk about those types of ways to be creative, but I think ultimately it's, it's asking your marketing team who has the skill set to do this, right? Mm -hmm. To think of those interesting campaign hooks that dis display that quality. That's interesting. We actually just conducted some original research on consumer uh, shopping trends. And what we discovered is that older consumers are, of course, more price sensitive. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, of course, that's presumptive, but they are more price sensitive coming into this, this shopping season, while younger consumers seem to be just less 
uh, price conscious and just more concerned about value. So it really mm -hmm. is understanding uh, what your consumers ultimately want and delivering messaging and communications that attract them. Like, what does that look like? For you, what does that mean for, for marketers? Yeah, I mean, I think it's not being scared of talking about those things and, and really showing that you do care about them. And the more that you do care about them, and a lot of brands now truly do care about them, right? A lot of D2C brands, I mean, we worry that sometimes price is the, f the focus, and a lot of D2C brands tend to be more expensive than counterparts you could find maybe, you know, at big box stores or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you know, we have to give DTC brands more credit sometimes sure. where they do try to put out a good product, right? It's maybe later in their life cycle when they're trying to mm. come make margins, right? But there are people who come into it caring a lot and yeah. they come into it That's really cool. going for the quality. So if you if you are transparent about it and then people see what you said is true, that's like you're built for life at that point, right? I mean, there's always going to be brands popping up out of nowhere competing with you, but that's a good starting point. And if, if you talk about it and you talk about those values while you introduce yourself wherever you can, that's better than just a, hey, take a hundred bucks off first purchase, right? It reminds me of those like straight to DVD movies uh, that we would get from Disney. Yeah, those are fun, yeah. A Little Mermaid 2. You know. <laughs> little Mermaid, <laughs> Mermaid 2.5, yeah, yeah. 5, yeah, that's very topical right now. Um, so with all of that in mind, uh, so if discounts and price and alone aren't the answer, how can brands loyalize customers? Mm -hmm. That's not the only, if that's not the end all be all. Right, I mean, people still want a deal, right? right. They still want promotions, they still want to feel like know, you're giving them something. Right, I mean, like, I've, I don't think I've ever shopped for something online in the past, at least at least in the past half decade, where I haven't looked up a discount or a deal or promotion, regardless of what the cost of the item was or how valuable I deem it to be in, in that purchase. You want to save $10. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> why, like, why not? Like, so, I mean, sometimes you feel guilty, right? And you're like, oh, should I just let them have this five bucks? Like, but the point is that people want to feel like they did get something, right? right? Especially because... At the end of the day, you're probably giving away your email address at the very least, mm -hmm. if not your data, if not your cell phone. Maybe I think about this more than some people do, but you are giving people something. And at Dagny Dover, actually, we this is a core belief that we had, which is we don't want to discount a lot, but if you give us something in return, that's that's a that's a good trade off, right? Like you're doing something, you're allowing us to throw emails into your inbox, right? Totally, totally. Which is which is something that I, I imagine most consumers aren't actually thinking about like being able to give away something as, as seemingly arbitrary as like your email address, mm -hmm. which is like everyone has an email address and everyone gets a ton of emails yeah, and email address. Yeah. Like <laughs> and, uh, email addresses, a shopping, a shopping specific email address. It's yeah. So true. It's like, it's not, it's not a, a difficult thing to turn over unless you're a brand that someone doesn't want to engage with. Right. Uh, so brands should be really conscious of like trying to get that end goal, that value from, their end consumer it's an email address to be able to re-engage and retarget mm -hmm. that they have to deliver something that's more than just like hey shop for me right i mean unfortunately if there's a lot of testing going on right yeah. and testing is super crucial and important i think that's part of an answer for your question about how do you loyalize customers it's yes. test what works right see how long you can extend that period between trying to get them to buy the other thing or spend more money with you increase your ltv totally. before you have to give them some sort of discount right mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of like, hey, take 15% off because you bought before we have something new. Like there are people there who will just buy it because it's cool and they're interested and they're excited about it. But you do have to test. But the testing, what it ends up doing, and this is like a really big failing of testing. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of uh, marketing ops platforms out there that do this really well. Mm -hmm. oh, we can talk about it later. <laughs> um, where you can segment people into what types of behavior they're, they're going to exhibit, right? And then you can speak to them wherever. And what I'm getting at is, there are people who are discount sensitive, those who are not, right? You will get there, but most data will end up trending towards, yeah, give them a discount because it works. Sure. You can close a sale faster. So it's really enticing. And, you know, you can build businesses where you have a cycle, right? Sure. But obviously you have to plan into it. Planning is almost more important than the discounting. Mm -hmm. But a lot of D2C brands, especially ones that have higher price points because they're saying we are higher quality, discounting is sort of, an, you know, antithesis of that. Yeah. So... In order to be able to 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 handle that, manage that, and communicate to your customer in that way, and you need to make a special moment. Like this is really what I'm getting at, right? If you do discount, think around the campaign hook around the discount, mm -hmm. and see if you can work backwards to a point where the campaign hook is more interesting than the discount, right? It might not be for everybody, but that engages your marketing team, marketing team more. Um, that it will ultimately end up having overall engagement with the customer more too. 
And then those people who really just want a discount, you're going to end up throwing them a discount at the end of your campaign cycle anyway. Totally. Right. So testing is important, but don't assume that just because the easiest conversion is a discount, that that's the only thing that works. What's the impact of going for the easy play? The mar margin erosion. Yeah. Yeah. You know, especially if you don't plan into it. And a lot of brands will say, well, I'm comfortable with giving a 10% discount. Therefore, like I'll essentially put in a 10% margin for that or whatever the math works out to be and depending on your business. But you always end up discounting more than you want to, especially if you're trying to hit revenue goals, right? Because when you hit a revenue goal, you sometimes do it by giving discounts, right? So it's not the safe play for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And all of these are, are really great points. And I think a lot of brands are struggling to implement a targeted, uh, effectively segmented marketing strategy that really drives engagement with loyal customers, let alone net new customers. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd love to have you talk a little bit about like your philosophy when it comes to segmentation and, and being able to do that effectively. I know we here at Wonderkent certainly have our point of view where we are led uh, by revenue being a guarantee, where ultimately yep. we're looking at um, the, the utility of using a technology such as ours that allows us to identify uh, more consumers, more of who they are and where they are, and ultimately use that to build individualized communications to drive awareness, to send out retargeting messages that uh, engage consumers, ultimately loyalizes them, and ultimately delivering what it is that they want, therefore generating revenue for for those brands that, that partner with us. But from your perspective, like how can marketers think about uh, really driving those engagements via effective segmentation and understanding their customers. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, like what you're, what you're essentially saying is that people want to be communicated with, right? right? If they're signing up for email, they're at least wanting a discount, but they're also showing you that there's intent, right, to, to engage with what you're sending them. So those campaign hooks that you might make to, to drive some of that engagement in the communication you send to them, you know, you test those two, right? Obviously, that's really, really important. But the testing should give you feedback, right? And you should always be going into the test or going into the campaign, even if you don't have the time to build a test. Because honest, if you're really honest about it, you can't just test everything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to swap an email from X you know, to Y to Z right. in a, over the course of two days. But ultimately, always know what the goal is that you have, right? It's like, okay, we're just hitting revenue goal with this. Mm -hmm. like we, this is a moment where even if we get a 20% average discount, we'll still hit the goal of the revenue. Um, and we'll make we'll make up the discounting later. Like you have to have these plans in mind. So it's right. not you shouldn't be always scared of discounting, right? But you'll see the feedback from those campaigns. You'll see the feedback from your existing customers, from new customers, and the more segmentation tools you have in front of you, and the more tools you have to put people into groups, mm -hmm. you can then see how the data of all those campaigns kind of stretches across those groups, totally. right? More information is what I'm saying, right? Yeah. We are extremely data heavy as marketers now, and you sort of can't be a marketing, like a brand marketing only person anymore, at least for not in the past five years, right? But what that means is that those segmentations and that data you gain from the response to your campaigns from those people in those groups is so, so crucial because you have expectations, you have goals, but then what actually happens? And then that should immediately inform your future actions. And you should be doing these things sooner and, more, and with higher frequency and across more moments in the funnel and more moments across your year of sales. You know, we have quarterly goals, monthly goals, yearly goals. It don't don't get stuck in o October yeah. thinking, oh, I need a discount suddenly, right? When you could have learned what actually works for your user base, for your customer base. That's great. You said something really interesting about uh, understanding what your goals are. I think we as marketers have the tendency of trying to measure everything mm -hmm. because we have we're in just like this precarious place of always having to prove the value of the work that we're doing. Uh, can you speak to us just really quickly about how do you choose what markers and metrics of success you should look at to be able to make uh, appropriate decisions? Yeah, I mean, just be aware of where you are in the funnel, yeah. right? If you want to get more people and you're up, in, up high in the funnel, like find ways to get more people more effectively and make sure that you're staying to your brand message so you don't confuse people as they go down the funnel. If you're at the bottom of the funnel, we're trying to expand what the bottom of the funnel definition is, which is, I think, what Wonderkin helps people do, right? That's right. Um, you, you really focus on what the total value brought by those always on things is. I think one of the things about Wonderkin, one of the things about just email marketing in general, you want to get away from having to constantly build new stuff because right. that really taxes your marketing team. And in the current economic climate, you want to test, you have to test across more parts of the funnel now 
So you either have to hire more people and experts in different channels, or you have to get really efficient in lower funnel, right? Or both usually. But the point is that 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 work that's being done and that data you're getting, like those goals that you set are really crucial because you have to, you have to basically, I'm trying to find, think of the exact word here, but you have to be confident in it, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. So that's, what the, that's, that's why we measure so much because we plan so deeply as marketers, especially digital marketers. Like my whole job is basically, or used to at least be, big calculator, big spreadsheet, bunch of data points, see if we can get to the goal with as little money spent as possible. Right. That's a lot of allocation. It's a lot of attribution. Right. It's part of what the, the new job I have now, which is uh, at Prestian AI, where we are an attribution company trying to avoid this pixel apocalypse, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the measurement is really crucial because it helps you triangulate your choices and your decisions. A marketer isn't and shouldn't just say, oh, pure ROAS, go. But when you do measure, you get to learn how much of that goal you can confidently get to. Which is where, like, you know, uh, like a Wonderkind ROAS guarantee comes in because you say, "Cool, if these things are always on, right? Right. Then I can trust these to happen, and I can go focus on the other stuff. Exactly. Which, is, which like I said before, it's more important now to give your marketer marketing team room to go do the other stuff. Sure, and it's and for me, it's almost imperative. Where as we're facing. Uh, this cookie deprecation that is happening. What are they saying now? 2023? It's going to be like... It, it, it will happen. It will happen. Right. It's just like we're kicking the can a little bit. It's imperative that marketers are thinking about ways in which they can leverage first-party data. Yes. Create first-party data uh, opportunities where they are not only owning the information about their customers, but also being able to utilize and leverage that information to drive more effective communications at scale. Yes. And we help you do that at Wonderkin. That's literally what we do when we guarantee revenue. Uh, but it's just something to consider. <laughs> I don't know which camera I'm looking at. Consider. <laughs> something to consider for sure. Yeah, totally. Um, but Dean, what are some of the other, your, your other favorite strategies for maximizing customer lifetime value as we start to wrap up? I mean, LTV to me isn't just about uh, how much they spend necessarily. And yeah. I think this is something that I've been, I've been defining customer engagement, customer loyalty, customer value to a company, mm -hmm. not just as purely what they have bought, but also the other actions they take to help evangelize your brand, right? And loyalty is also, you should reward people for talking about you, yeah. right? One of the things that's happening in the market now in particular is there's a blurring of the line between a customer and an ambassador, right? And with reallocation of funds away from paid social mm -hmm. into new channels, whatever they might be, depending on the brand you are, but influencer and affiliate just constantly keep popping up. And that, it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. I can tell you from practice, it is a t way more work than you expect it to be to really build out an influencer and affiliate strategy. But one thing you do have is customers, right? And if you ask them to engage for you on your behalf, right, they might not be able to buy every single thing and, you know, cool, I got them for a first order and a second order and a third order. I'm increasing LTV. Like how much are they helping you market, right? Right. And, you know, I'm not a, brand marketer so the cool things you can do are up to the people who you want to inspire to be creative on sure. your team to do those things but i think there's a really big untapped resource and no one's really fully unlocked it but i think you know reviews have sort of helped with that a bit um and you know being cool with the review how you showcase it how you talk about how you use it in your marketing uh, at hatch collection that was really important for us in some of our new launches is getting reviews up up front and and it's up front and center in some of our advertising and our retention messaging too um so that engagement is, it's important and people forget about it because they think loyalty is just make them buy again, right? But the propensity to stay with your brand isn't just a purchase. It's also keep talking about you, keep posting about you, keep tagging you, whatever it might be. And in, at scale, that, that will get people to, to, to know about you. And I think most younger consumers, right? I don't have a statistic for this, but they're finding out about brands on, through influencers, so, on TikTok. Yes. Through through content that is different from what worked five, seven, eight years ago, right? And that's a good thing, you know? It's, you, you know where to meet people, so go, go meet them where they are, right? So th that's something I always talk to about on, uh, with my brand marketing teams is, we have a campaign, we have an idea, we have something we have to put in front of people, we need to put it where they are, right? I mean, exactly. I'm not the first person to ever say this, this is always talked about, but if people are engaging with brands without even buying them that give people ways to engage with their brand before they even buy you 
right? Because that's going to help you with acquisition costs exactly down the line. Right. Exactly right. I mean, the way we used to engage with the brands is like TGIF. Every, every <laughs> All right. Yeah. That works, though. You know what? You kind of have like a Coy Matthews like haircut going on right now. Do I? Okay. It's, it's a compliment. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> My girlfriend's going to be pissed that I didn't get a haircut before, before, before being on video, but... <laughs> but I'm right there with you. I didn't get a haircut either. That's one way I have. So like, you might have to cut that uh, coin. I don't, I don't <laughs> but know. it's a mess. <laughs> I mean, strategies for loyalty are difficult. Yes. That, that, I mean, I really want to be very clear about that. Just because, just because you think that you have to do something to build brand loyalty to build LTV somehow, like, like we said earlier, you have to start an acquisition by proving that you're valuable to whatever the value means to that consumer. You, and it becomes more complicated over time, right? And then on top of that. You know, you have to be able to, to find ways to use data to predict what might happen and tie that to what your brand is capable of doing, too, sure. which comes to the discount question. If you're not capable of discounting a lot, don't do it. Right. Work harder to find ways to not have to discount as much, but you have to then be more creative. I think that's good. And I think that leads me into to my final question for you is what should brands uh, be considering coming into the, the, the holiday season? The busiest, almost our Super Bowl of. of I have I have some fatalistic perspective on this. I don't know if you. Please, <laughs> so, I'm, ready. Um, <laughs> I'm ready. Last year was really tough for a lot of DTC brands, yes. um, especially the fall off from Black Friday into December. Mm-hmm. Everyone had these crazy goals. Not everyone. I'm being I'm exaggerating, but yeah. a lot of brands had really strong goals for December and November because they said, "Cool." COVID's doing something different than it has been doing since it started. Yeah. People are going to spend more money. Um, really put a lot of pressure on this and really make sure we start selling, right? And a lot of brands fell short in December. Right. And then January and February, you, you, you saw the, you know, digital marketing speak. You saw the CPMs drop like you expect to. Right. But the upswell didn't last very long. And there's more volatility came in. And Omicron lasted longer uh, in terms of its impact on people going back to work or being able to in, in, interact with the economy, right, and spend money. So it, it became more difficult. And... The expectation now is the same. People are telling me, I hear the exact same thing. Oh, we're going to have a great Q4. We're going to spend a lot of money. But what they've been seeing is it's way more expensive, way more volatile to scale into what used to happen. And people still aren't reacting to the new normal. They're, they're reacting to things are just janky right now. Yeah. Right? So to go back to the really big question is what do you do in the meantime? Mm-hmm. Right? You worry more about your middle and lower funnel and you get more more, I guess, traditional about your upper. Just get more people to know about you, have a cool brand, the clear story, and do the testing and the work to be able to, to figure out what's happening. So if you haven't done that work by now, which I hope you have, now is the time to understand like what your, what your strategic budgetary pain points are. How much are you willing to spend more than you probably plan to, to get in front of people? Yeah. Because CPMs always go up in Q3 and Q4, but the volatility right now is people want to go out there and try to fix the growth trend they've seen the past couple of years. People are getting tired of not growing as fast as they want to. Mm-hmm. So there, there, are, there is good news here. They're using influencers and affiliate marketing programs is working. You, you can set a clock to it if you do it at enough scale. And creative testing is incredibly important, mm-hmm. right? And messaging testing down the funnel is incredibly important, which is something Wonder Kid helps you do. Yes. So really lean on those things that you can control because the things you can't control, you, you're going to have to end up paying for in some way, whether it's with your time and testing or whether it's with literal more money. Absolutely. And we could have a, I was talking to Vadim before we, 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 we got on camera, we could uh, have a whole conversation around attribution modeling yeah. and what that means. Uh, but you, you point out something that's really difficult to do. It's like, you know, those brand sh- strategy, uh, discussing things around sustainability, your, your, uh, your company ethos and values. Yeah. So important, but like, notoriously difficult to measure in any tangible yep. way. But to your point, and I hope just to synthesize, it is it is critical. Table stakes. It's table stakes yeah. that brands are doing that right now, especially now. Yeah. There's so much competition and so much uncertainty. Great. Yeah. Well, Vadim, I'm so happy and fortunate to have had you on I appreciate this it. episode. Uh, I'd love for you to to tell the folks how they can reach out to you or get connected. Yeah, with you. I mean LinkedIn. I mean I don't know if there's gonna be a link in the transcript of the podcast, yeah. but find me. I'm the one who worked at <laughs> Maud and Hatch and Dagny Dover. Yeah, not the artist from uh, Soviet Union. <laughs> um, and then uh, I have a personal Instagram. It's pretty cool, but I think LinkedIn's the easiest way to to, to reach me. 
That's perfect. And guys, if you want to learn more about Wonderkent, uh, you can go to our site, www.wonderkent.co, uh, and check out some of our resources. We just released uh, 2022 Consumer Insights Report, which is phenomenal. It dives in deeper to some of the conversations that the and I had today. Also download our Market Outlook Report, which basically sets uh, the tone and understanding of what's going on as far as the current trends, considering the economic downturn, um, supply chain issues, just a whole host of topics that are relevant to you as marketers. Uh, Vadim, again, thank you so much uh, for, for being on the podcast thank you, with us today. Thank, thank you, Wonderkid. Absolutely. Yeah. Again, guys, that's individuality. Yeah.